1987. The Crown prosecutors opened their case with witnesses who had seen Teresa the morning she was abducted. What was it that caught your eye about the little girl that you saw? Well, she was wearing a bright red raincoat. And she was, she was just on her own, and I just wondered what on earth she was doing, why she wasn't at school at that hour of the morning. What stands out is that she said she wanted to go back home, and I think I remember her saying something about uh, playing with her birthday presents that she got at home. Was the man you saw in front of you or behind you? Behind me. He was walking down the footpath and then he crossed the road. The evidence put before the court showed that witnesses had seen Teresa on the streets of Napier at a time much later than the original investigation had calculated. Mikas's alibi for the early morning of that day meant nothing if she was abducted at a later hour. It's, it kind of, the whole situation stuck in my mind because the child did not look like it should be with this person. He looked at me, I looked at him, and his eyes were, you know, they were just evil eyes. The testimony of pathologists who examined Teresa's body was chilling. The death was as a result of asphyxia by manual suffocation. The injuries to the face would be consistent with the application of a hand across the mouth and nostrils. The stomach contents contained a small pink gelatinous mass similar to a half dissolved jube lolly. You know, there's a lot of factors about the last 15 years that we've learned to deal with and cope with. But when you hear the, the facts of what Teresa endured at that time, it's still, you know, it's really, really hard to listen to that. And, but when you first go in there, it's kind of, you know, really tense and full on, but you, you, you uh, adjust. And, ESR scientists took the stand and explained the process by which Mikas's semen had identified him as the murderer. I prepared these slides in this particular case. The likelihood of obtaining these DNA profiling results is at least 60 million times greater if the male DNA on the vulval slide originated from Mr Mikas than if it came from another unrelated male chosen at random from the New Zealand population. Following Sue Petrusevic's testimony, an American DNA expert gave evidence concerning the three pubic hairs retrieved from Teresa's body. As part of the mitochondrial genome, and the hairs that you analysed were identical to that within Mr Mikas's blood. That's correct. They matched. With the final evidence of the pubic hair DNA now before the court, it fell to the officer in charge of the investigation, Detective Sergeant Brian Shab, to complete the prosecution case. I knocked on the door, and the door was answered by the accused, and I now identify him as the man at the back of the court between the two prison officers. This case is about a little girl who went missing, a little girl who was found murdered, and this accused semen and pubic hairs being found in and on that little girl. It's about the patience of a police force which waited for science to catch up, and catch up it did. Members of the jury, have you unanimously agreed upon your verdict? We have. On the first count, do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? Guilty. On the second count, do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? Guilty. On the third count, do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? Guilty. On the fourth count, do you find the accused guilty or not guilty? Guilty. Is that the verdict of you all? Please proceed. And to hear that, it was, that's what it was, it was, this is the best words we can hear, except for, you know, hi mum, hi dad, 
I'm back. Did my voice reach to you? You are convicted of the murder of Teresa Clayton. You are also convicted of the right unlawful sexual connection and abduction. Brian Shab had finally been able to keep his promise to Teresa. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm pleased. Uh, well, I did what I set out to do. Um, the big team, we all got there, really. And um, you know, for me personally, it was great because, you know, I uh, made that promise to Teresa on the beach that day, and now, you know, I've, uh, I've fulfilled that. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a big thing for me. 5,600 days after that rainy Friday in June 1987, police finally saw the man who abducted, raped and murdered Teresa Cormack, sentenced to a life in prison. Till the story is told God, know she belongs to us again now. It's, she's out of the public. Well, she maybe never will be completely out of the public. I think we um, I, but said it before, it's now, now it's to just remember her and the happy things and, and be able to put that, the, the horrible... Oh, the anguish. Yeah, all that horrible stuff behind us as much as we can. Child killer Jules Micah sues government over alleged historic abuse. Tuesday, the 21st of October, 2008. The convicted killer of six-year-old Teresa Cormack is one of hundreds of people seeking compensation from the government for alleged historic abuse. Jules Micah was convicted in 2002 for the 1987 rape and murder of the Napier schoolgirl. Micah alleges that the abuse happened in the 1970s at Porirua Hospital in social welfare institutions and Salvation Army homes. The Dominion Post reported today that Micah has been ordered by a high court judge to undergo a medical examination at the request of the defendants in the case. Micah is suing the Attorney General, the Salvation Army, and the Crown Health Financing Agency. Courtesy TV3 News.